The case of Eileen Wuornos highlights issues that are prevalent in many other capital cases. When the U.S. Supreme Court decided in Ford v. Wainwright, 1986, that the Eighth Amendment prohibits the execution of a person who is insane and not aware of his execution or the reasons for it, relatively few people who suffered from mental illnesses were within that ruling. When the Supreme Court ruled in Atkins v. Virginia, 2002, that executing defendants with mental retardation was unconstitutional, it did not address the constitutionality of executing persons with mental illness. Mental illness differs from intellectual disability, previously mental retardation. Intellectual disability is measured by subnormal intellectual development with various cognitive deficiencies, usually appearing at an early age. The National Alliance on Mental Illness defines mental illnesses as medical conditions that disrupt a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others, and daily functioning. On August the 8th, 2006, the American Bar Association passed Resolution 122A, recommending that individuals with severe mental illness be exempt from the death penalty. An almost identical resolution was approved by the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and the National Alliance on mental illness for the mentally ill. The resolution addresses the various points in capital cases where the defendant's mental illness can be relevant, the defendant's intent when the crime was committed, the defendant's ability to assist in his or her defense at trial and post-conviction proceedings, the defendant's competency to waive appeals, and the defendant's mental condition at the time of execution. It recommends exempting from execution those defendants whose mental illness impaired their capacity a. to appreciate the nature, consequences or wrongfulness of their conduct, b. to exercise rational judgment in relation to conduct, or c to conform their conduct to the requirements of the law. It also suggests exempting those who cannot effectively assist counsel or understand the punishment they are to receive. A sentence of death should not be carried out if the prisoner has a mental disorder or disability that significantly impairs his or her capacity to make a rational decision to forego or terminate post-conviction proceedings available to challenge the validity of the conviction or sentence, to assist counsel or to understand the nature and purpose of the punishment or to appreciate the reason for its imposition in the prisoner's own case. Insanity is a legal term not a medical diagnosis. The term incompetency is also sometimes used as an alternative to insanity. It refers to any mental illness severe enough to affect the defendant's ability to understand the crime he or she is committing, the trial proceedings or the punishment for the crime of which he or she was convicted. Insanity can affect a capital case at three points. First, if the defendant was insane at the time of the crime, he or she can be found not guilty by reason of insanity. In most states, the burden of proof falls on the defense to show that the defendant was insane. The jury must decide based on testimony by psychiatric experts and other evidence presented during the trial, 
when the jury hands down a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, the defendant is committed to a mental institution. Four states, Kansas, Montana, Idaho, and Utah, do not allow a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. Second, if the defendant is incompetent at the time of the trial and can't understand the legal proceedings or cooperate with his or her counsel, then he or she can be found incompetent to stand trial. In most states, a judge makes this determination. If such a finding is made, the defendant is sent to a mental institution to be treated until he or she regains competency. Finally, a defendant who is insane as his or her execution approaches can be found incompetent to be executed. Under Ford versus Wainwright, it is unconstitutional to execute an inmate who does not understand his or her punishment or the reason for it. However, if the inmate's competency is later restored, he or she can then be executed. The case of Eileen Wernus highlights some of the legal hurdles mentally ill capital defendants can face during their trials and appeals. Wernus was never found legally insane, but a mental illness played a role in mitigation during her trial and in her decision to waive her appeals. Mental health experts linked Wernus's mental illness to the serious abuse she suffered in childhood. Court documents detail the mistreatment she endured. Her mother abandoned her as an infant. Her father committed suicide in prison while serving time for child molestation. She suffered physical abuse by her grandfather, who also committed suicide. And she had a sexual relationship with her brother at a very young age. When she was in junior high school, school officials treated her by administering mild tranquilizers. After being raped by a family friend at age 14, Wernus was blamed by her family for the resulting pregnancy, forced to give the child up for adoption and thrown out of the house, rendering her homeless. Mental health experts have pointed to a history of such abuse as a trigger to the development of borderline personality disorder. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 4th edition, defines borderline personality disorder as marked by a pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal relationships self-image and affects and marked impulsivity. When Dr. Harry Kropp examined Warnus in July of 1992, the year of her trial, he found her to be suffering from a full-blown delusional system and having a borderline personality disorder with paranoid features. Based on a review of Warnus's records, Psychologist Dr. Jethro Toomer stated, the totality of the data is consistent with a diagnosis of a borderline personality disorder, the existence of which lifelong and has adversely impacted Miss Wernus's overall functioning and adaptive capacity. This disorder is characterized by a pervasive pattern of instability in mood, affect, identity, and interpersonal relationships presented in a variety of contexts and situations. She has exhibited transient periods of bizarre behavior, irrational impulses, and delusional thoughts. Her overall functioning has been characterized by the existence of many psychotic episodes where reality is blurred and she's unable to adequately test reality. Her condition is chronic and unpredictable. Predispositional family history of BPD is characterized by early trauma and nurturance deprivation consistent with the above diagnosis 
and serves to negate the stability and predictability of life necessary for acquiring a consistent pattern of behaving and thinking. Experts later testified about the disorder's symptoms, including delusional thoughts, bizarre behavior, and many psychotic episodes that might have influenced both her decision to confess to the murders, to legally protect her lover, Tyria Moore, and more important, to commit the murders out of a possibly delusional fear of being raped. At trial, the defense presented evidence of Warnus's diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. The state's expert agreed with the borderline personality disorder diagnosis. The defense tried to show how the disorders related to the inconsistencies in her confessions and that she wasn't lying in conventional terms, which prosecution witnesses disputed. The defense also tried to show evidence of brain damage from childhood and that her disorders impaired her ability to conform her conduct to the requirements of the law. During the sentencing trial, the jury found the only mitigating factor to be Wernus's diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. The judge found she had antisocial and borderline personality disorders. Wernus later argued on appeal that at trial she was not allowed to introduce evidence of the traumatic effects of rape on her mental health and decision making. She had always maintained the first victim, Richard Mallory, had violently raped her and she shot him in self-defense. The courts found post-traumatic prostitution stress disorder is not accepted by medical science. It was later that journalists discovered Mallory had served time in prison for the rape or attempted rape of another woman, but this information, not known at the time of the trial, was not introduced in her defense. Mental illness continued to be a dominant issue in the case after Wernus was sentenced to death. Her mental health significantly deteriorated during her time on death row. Numerous attorneys appealed to the courts on her behalf, citing her bizarre and delusional behavior. The defense lawyer who defended Wernus in her trials, Billy Nolas, told the press, she is the most disturbed individual I have represented. As she has gotten older and older, she's gotten worse and worse. She's like a kid. In a letter to the Florida Supreme Court, Wernus's appeals lawyer, Rag Singhal, explained, in court and at the jail, she exhibits bizarre behavior, laughing and crying at inappropriate times and obsessing on points having no importance to her cases. Warnus herself wrote to the courts with apparently delusional claims of abuse by prison staff that included pressurizing chambers with head shrinking devices, harassment and food cooked in dirt. As one of her attorneys, Charles Kaplan, wrote in a petition, petitioners' claims of prison abuse and mistreatment are either true or false. They are clearly believed to be true by the petitioner based upon her writings and behavior in court on July the 12th, 2002. If true, petitioner's claims must be resolved and corrected. If false, petitioner's claims further support previous expert findings that she is delusional and mentally ill. Wernus began to refuse to meet with mental health experts or her attorneys. She persistently filed petitions to waive her appeals and volunteered for execution in long rambling letters. A legal battle ensued over her competency to waive her appeals. Governor Jeb Bush ordered a mental health assessment conducted simultaneously by three experts. Some sources say this was a 15 minute interview while others say it was 30. Her attorneys, however, disputed that a 30-minute examination conducted by three experts simultaneously and without a comprehensive review of her records could adequately assess her condition. As one petition asserted, a person with borderline psychosis is not continuously 
openly psychotic, but might be psychotic in for her special traumatic situations. In a 30-minute interview with many people attending, there is no chance that the psychiatrists may be able to find her psychotic dilemmas. Nevertheless, the three psychiatrists concluded Wernos was competent to waive her appeals. In her last statement before execution, Werner said, I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus, June the 6th, like the movie, Big Mothership and all, I'll be back. Does that sound like someone who is in their right mind? The media branded Eileen Wernus as the first female serial killer in US history and turned this theme into the centerpiece of her trial coverage. Prosecutors jumped on this notion in making their case and trying to prove how dangerous she was. Television and tabloid coverage that made her out to be a man-hating lesbian murderer helped sway public opinion against her. The sex role stereotypes constructed by the media allowed the prosecution to build its case around the fact that women typically do not commit violent crime, especially against strangers, making it easier for a jury to decide against her. Within two weeks of her arrest, three top investigators on her case retained their own lawyer to field offers from Hollywood cringing with embarrassment when their unseemly haste to profit on the case was publicly revealed. Although Wernus changed her story numerous times regarding what happened in each of the murders and whether she acted in self-defense, her claims of a media bias remained consistent. Before her initial trial, Wernus requested a change of venue because of all the publicity her case had received. Her request was denied. This issue was brought up again on appeal, but the appellate court found that parties were able to select jurors who all agreed that any pretrial publicity would not bias them and would not interfere with their ability to honor the trial court's instructions. When Wernus was asked by a reporter after the first trial concluded why she was found guilty, she claimed it was because of media coverage that was out to get her. Another troubling aspect of this case was law enforcement's involvement with the media. Three police officers were relieved of their duties because they had entered into deals to be part of a major motion picture being made about Wernus. This called into question the credibility of some of their testimony, which may have been influenced by the money they received for their role in the case and the subsequent movie deal. It was later discovered that Wernus's lawyer, Stephen Glazer, who lacked prior criminal law experience, took her case for self-promotion, as he knew how much media coverage the case was receiving. Assistant public defender Trisha Jenkins said, Glazer told me he was only taking on the case because he needed the media exposure. Glazier requested $25,000 in return for speaking to documentary filmmaker Nick Broomfield and discussing Wernus's case with him. Wernus had no money to pay him, so his compensation came from interviews. He failed to investigate the officers who were making money from their movie deal and advised Wernus to plead guilty to all of the charges because of his limited legal experience and the lack of resources at his disposal. Although there was little debate about Wernus's guilt, media coverage likely played a role in her receiving the death penalty for her crimes. Eileen Wernus's appeals raised the issue of inadequate representation in her trial for the murder of Richard Mallory, as well as in her other five cases, the murders of David Spears, Charles Cascarden, Tony Burris, Charles Humphreys, and Walter Antonio, for which she pled guilty or no contest. In her appeal to the Florida Supreme Court, Wernus contended that her penalty phase lawyer in the Mallory case 
failed to call as mitigation. Witnesses, people who had known her as a child and who would have humanized her by describing the abuse she experienced. The court held that her counsel was not ineffective because much of the information offered by those witnesses was presented to the jury by three defense experts who testified during the penalty phase. In addition, Wernus claimed inadequate representation because her defense counsel had not uncovered evidence of Mallory's past criminal conviction, which could have corroborated her argument that she committed the murder in self-defense. The court rejected this claim because such evidence is admissible only under two conditions. The first is to present the general reputation for violence the victim has in the community. And the second is to allow evidence of the specific violent acts of the victim if known to the defendant. In responding to Wernus's appeal, the Florida Supreme Court stated that the defendant does not claim that she was aware of Mr. Mallory's criminal past at the time of his murder. Consequently, the fact that Mr. Mallory was charged with a sex offence well over 30 years prior to his fatal encounter with Wernus is not relevant. Wernus's appeal in the Walter Antonio case, in which she originally pled guilty, argues that Glazer, her lawyer, professed a lack of experience needed to represent her during a guilt phase trial and, as a result, had an inherent conflict of interest when permitting her to enter a guilty plea. She also argued that a plea was not voluntary because Glazer did not advise her of its consequences. Trisha Jenkins, Wernus's original attorney, later testified that Glazer had not picked up discovery files from her regarding Wernus's case. In her appeal of the Charles Cuscarden case, in which Glazer filed Wernus's guilty plea, Wernus claimed a conflict of interest between herself and Glazer based on movie and book deals Glazer had sought. Additional problems with Glazer's representation were raised in the documentary Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer, in which Glazer requests payment of $25,000 for an interview, stating that Wernus was unable to pay him and he needed the interview payment to work on her case. In 2001, Wernus dropped her appeals. Numerous attorneys, advocacy groups and mental health experts appealed to have the courts allow them to act on her behalf, arguing that her deteriorating mental state made her incompetent to waive her appeals or to be executed. Although Wernus's case raises a number of other issues, problems with her representation were the main focus of her appeals. Similar problems have arisen in other capital cases in which overworked public defenders cannot give cases the attention they need. Additionally, Glazer's quest for publicity highlights the particular dangers in highly publicized cases and illustrates the influence of the media in such cases. The death penalty is intended only for the worst of the worst crimes. In order for juries to determine whether a particular defendant deserves a sentence of death, they must weigh evidence that this murderer is actually one of the worst of the worst, the aggravating factors, against the reasons for sparing him or her, the mitigating factors. States vary in the specific circumstances they define as aggravating factors, but generally include murders committed during the commission of another crime, murders committed for monetary gain, murders of police officers, multiple murders, or other murders considered to be particularly aggravated. Mitigating factors frequently address the defendant's background, including a history of mental illness or intellectual disability, previous trauma suffered by the defendant, or the absence of a prior criminal record. A defendant who has faced life with physical or emotional handicaps 
may be deemed less fully responsible for his criminal actions. As mitigation has become recognized as a critical part of a capital trial, defense attorneys have turned to mitigation specialists to investigate defendants' backgrounds. Mitigation specialists examine defendants' family history, medical history, educational and employment background, and any other element of an individual's life that may convince the jury to return a sentence other than death. With this information, they assist defense counsel in presenting a coherent case for mitigation. The role of the mitigation specialist is so central to a client's defense that the American Bar Association includes them in their guidelines on the defense in death penalty cases. The defense team should consist of no fewer than two attorneys, an investigator and a mitigation specialist. In the commentary to this guideline, the ABA says, a mitigation specialist is also an indispensable member of the defense team throughout all capital proceedings. Mitigation specialists possess clinical and information gathering skills and training that most lawyers simply don't have. They have the time and the ability to elicit sensitive, embarrassing and often humiliating evidence, for example, family sexual abuse, that the defendant may have never disclosed. They have the clinical skills to recognize such things as congenital, mental or neurological conditions, to understand how these conditions may have affected the defendant's development and behavior, and to identify the most appropriate experts to examine the defendant or testify on his behalf. The defense team's mitigation evidence is presented during the penalty phase of the trial after the prosecution's aggravating evidence. Juries are instructed to consider both sets of factors, but not simply to count the number of factors on each side and determine the sentence based on whether there are more aggravating or mitigating factors. Rather, jurors are expected to use their own judgment in deciding which factors carry greater weight. If the aggravating circumstances are stronger, juries may choose a death sentence, but if the mitigating circumstances are more compelling, they must choose a life sentence. The mitigating evidence presented in Eileen Wernus's trial focused on her traumatic childhood and mental illness. Three psychologists testified that Wernus suffered from borderline personality disorder, likely brought on by her traumatic upbringing. The jury's sentencing recommendation found only one mitigating factor, that the defendant suffered from borderline personality disorder. The judge, however, found five mitigating factors. Despite the facts inexcusably undetected by investigators, the death sentence was extremely harsh to begin with in this case, considering the mitigating evidence in the punishment phase of the trial. The defense showed that Wernus suffered a tragic, abusive upbringing, which resulted in antisocial and borderline personality disorders. During both the trial and her appeal, the court declined to find the statutory factor of extreme emotional disturbance. This case, from the early investigations to the appeals process, has been tainted by publicity and media drama. Three top investigators in the case hired lawyers within weeks of the arrest to field offers from Hollywood concerning movie deals. At the time of the killings, Wernus was working as a highway prostitute. All of the men she killed were men who picked her up and who she says violently attacked her. Wernus was picked up by many other men during this period, and she did not harm them. Several men have testified that they spent days or weeks with her, and she never threatened them. They did say that she was worried that they would attack her. 
Prostitutes are more likely to be raped than women in other jobs. One study of a group of prostitutes said that they had been raped an average of 33 times a year. Wernus has been tried only once for the killing of Richard Mallory, but has been convicted of six murders. In her videotaped confession, which was the key evidence used by the prosecution in her trial, Werner said more than 60 times that she acted in self-defense. None of these references was included in the version of that tape, which was shown to the jury. The prosecution claimed that Mallory had no history of sexual violence. It was later revealed that Mallory had been convicted of attempted rape in Maryland and had threatened to harm other women. Evidence of these prior attacks was not presented at her trial, yet the jury was allowed to hear evidence of crimes Wernus had not been convicted of. Her trial attorneys first failed to interview and later failed to call several witnesses who had volunteered information which corroborated Wernus's testimony. Her trial attorneys delayed in researching evidence of Mallory's history. The judge then ruled it inadmissible because it was introduced too late. Private attorney Stephen Glazer encouraged her to plead no contest to five murder charges without securing a sentencing offer or informing her of all her options. There is evidence that Volusia County Sheriff deputies negotiated contracts for book and movie deals about Wernus's case before she was even arrested. Deputies arranged with Tyria Moore, Wernus's former girlfriend, to set Wernus up. Though Tyria was implicated in several of the killings, she was never charged. Officer Brian Jarvis, initially the chief investigator on the case, was removed from the case when he questioned the conduct of his colleagues on the case. He later reported vandalism to his house, theft of his records on the case, and threats against him and his family. According to the prosecution, portraying Wernus as a serial killer won them the death penalty. Prosecutors made repeated references to Wernus's romantic relationship with women. 80% of women on death row in Florida are lesbians. Though Wernus does not consider herself a lesbian, society's fear and hatred of lesbians was used against her. People have trouble believing that a prostitute would need to kill six times in self-defense. Yet recently, a Los Angeles store owner killed five men in four different armed robbery attempts. This man was never charged with any crime. Tens of thousands of women are in prison in the US for killing men who abuse them. A study by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence found that men who kill their wives or girlfriends serve an average of two to six years, while women who kill their male partners serve an average of 15 years. Ted Bundy, who killed more than 30 women in Florida, had offers from several well-known private criminal attorneys to defend him pro bono. At one time, his defense team included five public defenders and a volunteer consultant on jury selection. Wernus's supporters have been unable to find any such assistance for her. She has had to rely on overworked public defenders.